You are listening to Neurosalience, the OHBM podcast. Welcome to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Neurosalience podcast. I'm your host, Peter Banatini. Here, I interview neuroscientists and discuss their work as well as the latest developments, issues, and controversies in the field of brain mapping. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Javier Castellanos, who's a psychiatrist and a highly influential scientist who's been working in neuroimaging for over 20 years towards the goal of leveraging MRI, fMRI, and other approaches to better understand and treat children and adults with psychiatric disorders. Dr. Castellano studied Chomsky and linguistics at Vassar College, experimental psychology at the University of New Orleans, and medicine at Louisiana State University in Shreveport, receiving his MD in 1986. He was the first uh, uh, cohort uh, in a cohort of triple board residents, combining training in pediatric psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry at the University of Kentucky. In 1991, he conducted child psychiatry research at the National Institute of Mental Health under the supervision of Judy Rappaport. After being there for a decade, he, uh, finally in 2001, he moved to New York University where he's now an endowed professor of child and adolescent psychiatry and professor of radiology and neuroscience at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. He's also been a research psychiatrist at Nathan Klein Institute since 2006 with a focus on using intrinsic functional connectivity approaches in human and translational studies. He was an early advocate of using resting state fMRI and the creation of consortium driven databases. Dr. Kaiselinos is one of the most impactful clinical neuroscientists in brain mapping. He has an H index of 124 and over 70,000 citations. He's highly collaborative and is truly an outstanding mentor having won the inaugural OHBM Mentor Award. And uh, having mentored actually four uh, OHBM Young Investigator awardees. So he's obviously doing something right. And in this podcast, we actually uh, talk quite a bit about his, uh, about his formative years starting out in research. Um, you know, what, what key decisions he made, what key influences he had, um, uh, directions he went. And I think it's actually really interesting to, to look at his example of how he sort of was open and exploring different ways he could go and then finally settling on something that resonated with him, which was uh, psychiatry, and then eventually neuroimaging. And he, he makes sure he mentions that uh, Judy Rappaport was extremely influential in his career. Um, so after spending some time talking about that, we talk a little bit about the state of psychiatry and, and the state of imaging and how it fits in with psychiatry. Uh, he expresses both hope and pessimism, uh, a little bit of pessimism or real realism, I guess, about you know, what imaging can and can't do. Um, whether it can be used to diagnose uh, is, is probably uh, uh, a bit doubtful since there's cheaper, faster ways of doing this, but uh, he's very hopeful that neuroimaging lends insights into understanding in more detail the mechanisms of these disorders and the physiology of these disorders, which would help to aid better treatment. And we go into his discussion of uh, uh, creating these large databases, these large collaborations, and we talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the, the issue of small effect sizes and the variability across centers and their scanners causing these large databases to maybe have uh, less uh, of a large effect size or more noise than, than uh, required. So um, talk a little bit about RDOC, a initiative at the NIH to uh, ground uh, psychiatry in in more uh, brain data. And uh, then we finally uh, talk a little bit about his mentorship and uh, what it means to be a good mentor. Uh, he emphasizes uh, you know, basically uh, giving direction, but stepping out of the mentee's way when they're, when they're on, on, the, on a path that they're, that's, 
that's working, uh, being flexible, uh, tailoring your mentorship to, to your mentee, and, and things like that. So it's a, it's a really good discussion at the very end about, about what it means to be a good mentor. So I hope you enjoy this podcast. Okay. All right. Well, today we have Xavier Castellanos. And I don't know if you, if that's, you know, I, I always sort of struggle over Xavier or, or do you want to be called Francisco or it's Xavier Castellanos? Well, it's even more complicated than that. Uh, when I went to my college interview, I introduced myself as Xavier Castellanos and this uh, wonderful Panamanian woman who is a, a graduate of Vassar College looked at me and said, Xavier Castellanos, I thought I was going to meet Javier Castellanos. <laughs> <laughs> and so ever since then, I don't mind what anyone calls me, but if you ask me my name, I'm going to say it's Javier Castellanos. Okay. But it's spelled with an X, which makes it even more complicated. But, you know, it's, it's like the J spelling, which most people. Yeah, do. actually, that's interesting, because I, I think I have been pronouncing it that way. And I mentioned it to my wife and she, and she saw the spelling. She's like, no, that's Xavier. And I'm like, no, I think it's <laughs> Xavier, Javier. It has it's, more pronunciations than you can imagine, because it's Xavier, Xavier, you know, it, it goes on and on. But uh, anyway. OK. All right. Well, either way. All right. Well, 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 thanks for coming on to this uh, uh, Neurosalience podcast. And. And just to start out, I mean, I was looking at a little bit of your uh, uh, history, and what, one thing kind of struck me at the very beginning. Uh, you know, the first thing I want to ask you is, is, as far as what motivated you and what were the key decision points in your career. But also, what struck me is that you you emphasize in, in you know some of the bios I was reading that you you started out with uh, studying Chomskyan linguistics in Vassar. So um, maybe. Uh, if you could talk about that a little bit uh, from your uh, looking at your history as well. So, you know, I don't know that it's, it's something to emulate, but my sort of career trajectory has been a whole series of, of uh, kind of leaps into the unknown one step at a time. And um, I went to college with really very little sense of what that was. I, I didn't know anyone who had. Um, and uh, I only applied to Vassar and Stanford because they, I knew that they had independent majors. Um, didn't get into Stanford, uh, but Vassar was uh, recruiting. Uh, I was in the second class that had men starting from uh, the first year. And uh, they were very generous because uh, you know we, we didn't have a lot of money. We were first generation immigrants. And so I uh, started and I had a terrific calculus class my first semester because I was flirting with the idea that maybe I could be a math major. I was very good in math in high school. This was in Louisiana. And uh, my math professor was delightful and he taught a class of calculus without analytical geometry. So we just did the proofs and it was a purely, you know, uh, no applications whatsoever. It was really about working through Leibniz and, and, yeah. and, and uh, you know, all of that. It was uh, delightful. And during that semester, he found out that his uh, dissertation in math was no longer viable because someone else had just published his theorem. And he'd spent seven years on that. Oh my gosh. And so he just said, ah, I'm done with math. And he decided to shift to linguistics. And he turned me on to Chomsky who I'd never heard of before. Oh, and okay. <laughs> and uh, Chomsky was known for his anti-war efforts and because he had been, you know, such a, um, an important figure in response to Skinner. Um, you know, B.F. Skinner had written this tome on verbal behavior, which was just crap, you know, that we learn language by reinforcement of individual tokens and, and Chomsky just destroyed that. Yeah. And, uh, and he was embarked, you know, and he still is embarked on this attempt to kind of reverse engineer the mind by understanding how we acquire language in such an amazing way. Yeah. It certainly appealed to me tremendously. And I spent uh, you know, some wonderful times thinking about Chomskyan grammars and, and how to apply those, in fact, to Spanish, which I started to recover. Um, while I was there, I spent a semester in Spain, which was one of the highlights of my life. And uh, after a year of thinking about uh, 
what was grammatical or not, because that's really what a linguist does is, is you know, we use ourselves, we're, we're the data, right? To, so it's, it's very introspective. I felt like a monk. I, I literally would spend six hours a day thinking linguistics for, wow. for about an eight month period. And I thought, okay, that was interesting. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> really lonely work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm amazed that, right. I mean, there's such a structure that you can actually delve into it like that and, and sort of- Well, it was, you know, if this rule is in this order, then is this outcome gonna be grammatical or not? And so, you know, literally we're, I'm an informant, right? And so it was, yeah. I did a, a case grammar of reflexives in Spanish, which was really kind of fun. Yeah. And my, my advisor said, you know, you could publish this. Said, you know, I, I didn't know what she was talking about. But I, she thought I, she could get me into a linguistics uh, doctoral program. And as I said, I sort of ruled that out. It's a long circuitous uh, story, but I wound up um, in a master's program in psychology at the University of New Orleans doing psycholinguistics. And that probably would have been good enough because it was empirical, it was kind of cool. Um, getting into you know the brain through through experimental methods, yeah. Um, but my professor got a Fulbright and spent a year in Stockholm, um, and uh, left me and, and his master's student in the lab, and we continued to run the studies and we we're having a good time doing reasonable work. I got a paper out of it, etc. But that was the year that uh, one of the local um, endocrinologists, Andrew Shalley, was a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize for his work on LHRH and peptides. Okay, okay. And it turned out that, this was in New Orleans, that um, Shalley uh, and uh, Abba Kasten had a collaborator that was a chemist who was the only person in the world who could synthesize beta endorphin. And so my prof other professors in the department uh, had a collaboration with this person and had access to beta endorphin. And I thought, if the brain makes its own morphine, what else is in there? Uh, and so I switched from psycholinguistics to psychopharmacology and I changed from my previous professor to, to this other person. And I did a bunch of different things with endorphins, with naloxone, with, with uh, pain perception. Um, and after my 150th rat castration, I thought, you know, I think I probably am better working with humans than with rats. <laughs> so that's when I decided to go to medical school. And because I was a master's student, I didn't have to ask anybody permission. I took organic chemistry to figure out whether I could do it or not. And I learned how to memorize, which is all that that's about. Yeah, we get it, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I was getting a stipend, uh, so I, it wasn't costing me a lot of money. And I was working as a part-time translator on the side for my mom. And so uh, I took the courses, I took the MCAT, and I only got into one school, but that's all it takes. And that yeah. was in Ellison Shreveport. <laughs> yeah. And then when I finished, there was a brand new way of uh, training that combined pediatrics with adult and child psychiatry, which had never existed before. And I didn't find out about it until a week before it would have been too late. But in that one week, I totally mobilized. I was paralyzed before that because I kept looking for what was I going to do. Yeah. But that really galvanized me, and I was accepted into two of the six programs, uh, not into the one I really wanted to go to, but it turned out to be just fine. And so I spent five years at the University of Kentucky. Um, amazing, wonderful time. It's since, you know, that was sort of a heyday, um, in part because insurance and HMOs and all that kind of have really taken things apart in, in many places. Yeah. Uh, but at least for a while, there was a kind of golden moment where everything seemed to be working in the right direction. It was an amazing training experience. Yeah, yeah. But I also had the sense that maybe I'd wanna go into greater depth. And so I was fortunate to get a fellowship uh, to attend the American Psychiatric Association. And they have these very early morning breakfasts for, you know, if you're interested in research, seven o'clock in the morning or something like that, come meet the researchers. And I went to the table that had a flag on it that said child psychiatry. And I sat down next to the person leading the group. And I said, where should I think about doing a fellowship? And he gave me the name of you know, several different places and said, and of course there's Judy Rappaport at NIMH. Ah. As he spoke, Judy came in about 15 minutes late <laughs> and came to her table. And so I
excuse myself from Jerry Weiner, who was the head of, uh, he was actually the chair of psychiatry at GW at the time, and uh, went to sit next to Judy and introduced myself and said, you know, I'm training in pediatrics and child psychiatry. And she said, can you do spinal taps? I said, yeah. I said, well, let's talk. <laughs> So she hired me because I could do spinal taps because she was doing a study looking at CSF of kids with ADHD. That's interesting. As Cruzy and, and Joe Alaya had started. And, uh, you know, I did them for clinical reasons, but, but I knew how to do them and actually sort of really enjoyed them. Uh, sounds very macabre. <laughs> but uh, I did that for a couple of years as part of the studies that she had started back in 1986, which is, you know, I started there in 91. Yeah. Um, and so we were getting, you know, blood and urine and CSF and analyzing the classical, you know, uh, monoamine metabolites, right? It was uh, CSF, uh, HVA and MHPG and um, HIAA, et cetera, looking yeah. for clues. There's one little problem with that. You cannot get healthy controls. Uh, yeah. With spinal uh, you can't just do spinal taps on. on you cannot do spinal taps on healthy kids. Yeah. Marcus Cruzzi had tried to go to emergency rooms and, and see if he could get a drop or two out of kids that turned out not to have a problem. Yeah. It was hugely challenging because you know nobody cares. If, they, if you're trying to do an emergency spinal tap, yeah. <laughs> you just want to know the kid doesn't have meningitis. Right. They're going to save a little bit of fluid for researchers. So after a couple of years, I wrote two papers and, and you know we did correlative uh, analyses and you know who knows what what they mean uh, but in the meantime again I, I arrived Jay Geed and I arrived on the same day um, in uh, July of uh, 1991 and uh, in I think January of that year the 1.5 Cigna uh, had been installed down at the clinical center okay okay uh, yep. the, the Cygnus you know, the, the two of them yeah. And uh, each of the programs sort of got their slots and child psychiatry branch um, got the last choice. And so we had Tuesday nights after five, uh, which turned out to be ideal. For kids, I guess, at least. Right. For kids, we're trying, it's after school. Uh, we could go as late as we wanted to. Uh, BJ Casey's was sometimes there until late in the morning. Um, and, uh, but, you know, they would fall asleep. You're doing structural studies, not a problem. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Jay took that on as, as, you know, the primary person in charge of that. I was doing the ADHD studies and Judy one day said, would you mind if, you know, you're doing all these biological studies on these kids? What about if we get scans on them as well? Um, you know, of course, why not? Yeah. I said, you know, I don't think we'll see anything because, you know, Zemetkin had just published the PET study in adults and you know, it was, there was a difference with FDG, but structurally there wasn't anything obvious. And I thought, you know, is this sensitive enough to see that? Yeah. I was at least at the time wrong in the sense that we started to get some small uh, differences. Our first study was looking at the corpus callosum, huh. 18 kids per group. Okay. Uh, and Jay found that, um, um, uh, I'm blocking her name, the Canadian anatomist um, who was studying the corpus callosum had done a, an anatomic, you know, way of dissecting postmortem studies uh, a couple of years before that. And so we just did that on mid Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, anyways, uh, because this was early days, um, it got published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Um, you know, well, that, and that encouraged us, right? So yeah. we kept going. Okay. And, um, uh, the sample then became about 50 or so per group, and then it became uh, 140 or 150 per group over about a decade. Yeah. And by that point, we were trying to bring as many of them back every two years, and so it became a longitudinal study. And, and by that point, Tom Insole said, well, you probably don't want to fire these guys because, you know, <laughs> this is sort of becoming a nice study. Yeah, yeah. So they, they gave us, we were the first two um, staff scientists. Um, that uh, NIH created because- oh, really? That, so you were the, the first staff, your staff clinicians or whatever. We were the first two staff clinicians, Jay and I. Yeah. In fact, they didn't realize that um, they hadn't finished sort of all the paperwork. And so they gave us appointments without a termination date. 
So the fact though we were permanent employees. <laughs> <laughs> we were the last two to have that. Everybody after that got five-year terms in a renewable. Right, right, right. So you could have just stayed on with that. We had lifetime appointments, but, but not independence, right? <laughs> and so it was an amazing decade. Uh, you know, we were sort of learning as we went. Uh, we did the Caudate, the Putamen, uh, the Globus Pallidus, uh, you know, and and. Then we worked with Alan Evans and, and his colleagues in Montreal to do the, uh, you know, the big advance was getting white and gray matter by loeb. You know, that was the yeah. big. Right? Okay. <laughs> uh, and but at the same time, what made it work was that because of the, the uh, Judy's guidance more than anything and, and the extramural resources, we were able to recruit kids, about a third of whom had never taken medication. Uh, because that was always a question, right? Are these differences in brain structure reflecting uh, the toxic effects of medication or is this something that's really reflecting underlying, um, you know, right. correlates of the disorder? Yeah. And so you can never be definitive about that uh, in a non-experimental way, but at least we could say these data are not consistent with that. In fact, we had the largest differences in the unmedicated kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it wasn't that this was just an artifact of, of meds. Okay. So that paper made it into JAMA. Um, it took a decade to amass the data and to, to learn how to do that, but that was sort of my, my you know, coming out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't know you started with J. And also, I mean, back then it was just before fMRI sort of started catching on yes. as well. I mean, there was some, uh, maybe a little bit of fMRI with Bob Turner and Libby Hahn at, at the end. Well, and that's, and as I said, BJ Casey, who was a year before us, had started to, to pilot some stuff um, and so she would come on after we left with the anatomic studies and, you know, she and her groups would stay on as long as they could. Most nights they didn't collect anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were banging away trying to, trying to see if they could get some signals. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, those were, those were fun sort of pioneering days. That's, uh, that's exciting. And, and actually you finally, so that's actually, and obviously Jay's database and your, your database or that you started with Jay is, you know, that grew into something massive. And so we finally yeah. made it publicly available a couple of years ago. And so, you know, it's, um, yeah. And, it, and it's, it seems like it's, um, you know, it was a really nice, you know, longitudinal study over 20 years. And so, exactly. You know, it's the sort of thing, that's really what the intramural program is designed for, right? Because no one would ever fund you to do that. Right. And we wouldn't have set it out even, you know, it, it just grew. Yeah. Um, we had, you know, an initial positive result. And then it was like, well, let's just keep going. And, and the kids, you know, were enjoying it. It was, it was uh, sort of a positive experience. They would eagerly come back, uh, you know, at two-year intervals and all of that. So yeah. yeah, really, really wonderful. Well, that's great. That's great. So that's actually, uh, well, that's a, that's a wonderful story. And also we, I think, so if you left in 2001, I, I started in 1999. So we overlapped without, that's I don't know if yeah. I it was yeah. there, but maybe I did, but yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it was only a few years when I was just starting out there. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, 99 was, was the next sort of inflection year for me because I went to a meeting um, in here in New York, actually. Uh, it was at the New York Marriott down by the World Trade Center. It was the Tourette's uh, Syndrome 3, which was an every 10 year meeting. And um, Judy Walters, who's uh, been an NINDS for really her entire career, uh, and I had become friends because I would go to her for help in understanding, you know, what are these stimulants doing in, in the striatum, you know, and, and she's an amazing, um, you know, person and friend and, and, uh, and teacher. Um, I don't think anyone knows because she's so modest that she was the first person to identify dopamine neurons by their electrophysiologic signature. Oh, wow. Wow. She did that as a graduate student at Yale. Oh my gosh. Okay. And she taught all her fellow, you know, doctoral students, most of whom became chairs <laughs> based on that sort of. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. But Judy's so low key. She sort of said that to me kind of quietly. She says, you know, nobody knows, but I. <laughs> <laughs> so what is their signature? I mean, is it something that's describable pretty Straightforwardly, is it? Uh, uh, I don't even know. Uh, what no, they're they're fairly fast, uh, you know, uh, spiking neurons, and 
they differ from you know the cholinergics and and uh, you know these are these are GABAergic neurons. But what she showed in '99 that completely rocked my world was using a preparation that was only available for a window of time because uh, the techniques weren't sort of uh, there before. And then the ethics of doing research with rodents was really becoming more of an issue. And so she literally closed down her studies based on um, the concerns about the, you know, what it must be like to be a paralyzed awake rat yeah. um, with recordings you know, going on in your brain. Yeah. She took the utmost care to make them unstressed and, and you know, as comfortable as one be. Yeah. So um, she observed that when you had this calm, you know, rat, nothing going on in the lab, these neurons, these medial, medium spiny neurons. Uh, so I, I misled you when you said what do dopamine neurons uh, sound like? I, the, the answer is I don't know. In this case, these were medium spiny striatal neurons. Okay. That are uh, relatively rapid, but so on average they fire 20 cycles per second. Um, but they go up and they go down at about 30 to 60 second periods. Huh. For minutes at a time. It's interesting. Okay. It, and and those fluctuations are extraordinarily sensitive to catecholamines. So drugs like cocaine or methylphenidate. Uh, and they can be blocked by neuroleptics like haloperidol or, um, you know, another D1 antagonist, SGR 23391, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so she, she uh, presented this as, you know, perhaps something that was relevant to ticks and Tourette's and, and dopamine and striatum. And she and I spent three hours chatting at the top of the World Trade Center after that, because it completely blew me away. Huh. Such a careful experimentalist that I knew this was not an artifact. This was real stuff. And she yeah. worked through everything. It's not, you know, ventilator artifact and, and all these other things. And I thought, what in the world is the brain doing at these very slow periods? Well, unbeknownst to me, but she was aware that Barat's work in 95 had coincided with some of this. Yeah. And this was a couple of years before Marcus Rakel's, uh, you know, default mode of brain function, which, yeah. you know, he wasn't really able to sort of, uh, Steve Peterson couldn't figure out how to find that in MRI data, he told me. Uh, so there was this sort of stuff going on, but I had gotten hooked on the notion that ADHD it was really more about variability in behavior than any given specific cognitive disability. Right, right. More the inconsistency of performance rather than an ability to do any single thing. Yeah. And, but what if that variability is related to this kind of thing? Because they seem to be affected by catecholamines. And I told this to Judy and I begged and I pleaded and I said, Can I do a little bit of this on the side? And, you know, she, for quite a while, she said, you can do it after everything else is done. And then I sort of got wise to the fact that that meant never. And I went her with that. And she said, yes, I, I cannot understand what you really mean. And because you're not scientifically independent, I can't, you know, support it. So I, I understood that and I completely respected it. It was, it was really, as you know, that's, that's your responsibility, right? You have to be able to defend and explain why you're sending resources in this in these sort of cockamamie ideas. Yeah. So I did my best to try and, you know, to get some pilot intramural funds or things like that, but that wasn't really happening. I didn't really know what I was talking about too. I mean, it was just, I had this kind of inchoate. Intuition that the intuition. dynamics. But I felt like I got to figure out if this is going to mean something or not. It's just, it grabbed me. So around that time, I got a random phone call from somebody who said, you know, um, we've been recruiting a major pediatric neuroimager, but he's just jilted us and went to another institution instead. And we put together a package that included an apartment in New York. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's the thing that got me. Oh, that's cool. That's and we don't care what you do as long as, you know, you come start an imaging group. Yep. And 
I didn't know how to start an imaging group, but uh, you know, I worked with the one that sort of existed, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but I thought I have an idea that I I've got to find out if this is going to work, and so I started trying to figure that out with with NEARS, Near Infrared Spectroscopic Imaging, because I went to uh, Philadelphia to Penn to see Britton Chance, who I understood was doing this, uh, this work with NEARS. I uh, was one of the pioneers in that field. And I stuck one of these optodes on my forehead and the damn thing shows these, you know, infraslow fluctuations is immediately. <laughs> Just put it on the oscilloscope, it's right there, it's gigantic. Yeah, I thought I, we got to do this. Yeah, so I went to uh, came here to NYU, and I started trying to work with NEARS. But it, you know, again, uh, being early days is is often challenging. Yeah, um, I got a grant from the foundation that uh, let me purchase the first, first, first prototype from NEARX. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> You're always sort of helping them develop the product. Uh, it launched their company. Uh, they're now, you know, they sold and they're, I mean, it's a going thing, right? Now it's, it's they're, they, they always come to HBM and, and the Society for Neuroscience and other places. And, and uh, but, but we didn't publish a thing uh, with the prototype in, because it was too heavy and it was too, it took too long to, to get good signals. Uh, it, it was just that child friendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we gave them all the feedback and all of that. And eventually I gave it back because I said, I just don't even have the space for it. So in theory, I could get one back from them at any time, but, but that was a couple of corporate entities ago. Okay. okay. At any rate, uh, the next thing that happened was Mike Millam showed. Uh, actually, Mike Millam spent the month with Danny Pine. Oh, really? I didn't even know that. Okay. So okay. Mike uh, was doing his MD PhD at the uh, University of Illinois Champaign Urbana. Uh, and he had the wisdom to choose one of the few places that would let him do something that was clinically relevant. Most MD PhDs force you into working with cells of some sort or another, you know. And, uh, and so uh, he did, uh, he worked, uh, you know, published 10 papers during his PhD. Um, with, uh, oh my God, um, I can sort of refresh this, but, but uh, she's now in Colorado. Uh, Diana Parks? No, 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 Diana's at Washu. She, uh, I'm, I'm just, I just have to apologize to her, uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, he worked on, on uh, cognitive control and, and anterior cingulate and, and, uh, uh, and then he spent a month with Danny uh, and in a month got, you know, I think it was one first and two second authors or two first and one second or something like that because uh, Danny and his group had been collecting, you know, fMRI data, but they hadn't done anything with the, uh, the structurals. Okay. And so Mike said, hey, I want to work. I want to learn VPM. Do you guys mind if I use your data? <laughs> and so he processed a whole bunch of great. <laughs> Three papers out of one month. That's amazing. Now, he wrote to me because he wanted to come back to New York. But I didn't know who he was. And I, I didn't see his messages. I just thought, I guess they were spam. And fortunately, Dan Dickstein, who was still in that group, said to me, hey, there's this guy, Nick, Mike Millam. You want him. He's trying to get hold of you. You know, and I immediately then realized and, and Mike and I met. And he came uh, and did, you know, his residency and, and child fellowship uh, at NYU. And at the time I had a lot of flexibility because again, my my boss was was not at all in, a researcher. He just said, You tell me what you need and I'll try always try and give it to you. And I said, I need you to give Mike some money so he doesn't have to do moonlighting like everybody else does. Yeah. And he said, sure, how much do you need? And he said, yeah, X. So that's what he did. Yeah. So Mike and I shook hands that I would pay him to do a little bit of extra work as scientific moonlighting. You're just not allowed to go to the emergency room and do the other kind. And he was fine with that. Yeah, yeah. 
And so in nights and weekends, he basically set up a functional imaging group. Uh, and it took me about two years to convince him that there was something reasonable in this, uh, you know, low frequency fluctuation stuff I kept talking about. Yeah. And that happened because of Peter Frampton's paper, huh. uh, which was, you know, Peter's uh, physicist, in Karolinska, uh, like all imaging papers, there's usually more authors than participants, or at least the numbers are, you know, quite substantial. This was his first, and then there was one other paper where he was the only author. And I think that's because back then, resting state was so disreputable. Um, I don't know if that's true, but, but it was, you know, they're single author papers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in which he was describing these, uh, you know, what we now call resting state networks. Uh, and when Mike saw that, he said, oh, this is what you're talking about? Oh, this is easy, correlations, we can do that. And so he started literally doing those uh, on the van going back and forth to the Nathan Klein Institute because he was on a rotation there where he would have to drive up and back every day an hour each way. Yeah. So he was programming, uh, you know, and, and saying, you can't make this stuff go away. <laughs> it's like it's there in all the data sets I see, there are all these weird correlations, you know, that, that uh, uh, you know, gigantic magnitude compared to the stuff I'm used to looking at cognitive control in the anterior cingulate. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, that was kind of the turning point. And uh, we started uh, actively collecting resting state data. This was previously, I was working with task data that just uh, you analyzed. And, uh, you know, the first paper out of the lab we were really excited about it. Uh, so we sent the pre uh, inquiry because it was a relationship between reaction time variability and this anti-correlation between task positive and task negative networks in, in healthy controls. We thought, wow, this is very cool. So we, uh, we got a positive response to our pre-submission inquiry from Nature and Neuroscience and submitted it, then we got a mixed response and we submitted it and then a mixed response and then it went back and they got a, a tiebreaker reviewer. And on the third submission, it was still not ready for them. And so they rejected it. So then we went to Journal of Neuroscience and went through the same thing again, one, two, three, uh, and rejected on the third submission. Oh, gosh. And then finally at NeuroImage, it was accepted on the third submission. <laughs> wow that's uh that's that was surprising yeah that's uh that was claire kelly well a couple of things right we nobody knew us from anybody we were nyu nyu wasn't doing any brain imaging to speak of at the time yeah uh, we just gotten an allegra down in psychology the radiology department was sort of opposed to brain imaging on principle because they were very strong in the body and abdomen and, and okay. felt that it was too crowded. Uh, who was I? You know, Mike was still a resident. Uh, we, we just didn't, you know, yeah. we weren't yeah. known first. Yeah. Secondly, we didn't know the things you have to know. And so those nine versions, this was Claire Kelly, uh, who, you know, uh, you know, but uh, she developed the mini case of PTSD from that because it took, it, I mean, nine submissions in about nine or 10 months. I mean, oh the good news is the imaging field is relatively rapid. So you get kid at the teeth quickly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> in neurology, that could have taken five years, you know. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And so uh, we learned all the things you have to do to, you know, address reviewers' concerns uh, in, by getting that one paper through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's now one of our more highly cited papers. It's, you know, it's several hundreds of times and things like that. But uh, the next paper, uh, which I took the lead on because it was focused on ADHD, uh, really Daniel Margulies, who you know well, was and Mike uh, worked together on, on analyzing this. And, and as Mike said, the hard part was figuring out how to create a template of seeds that would follow the anterior cingulate. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and create that. And so that helped us 
to, to look at, um, no, but that was the anterior cingulate paper, but, but the other one was the, the ADHD paper, which we used uh, seeds that had already been published by, by um, um, it, it it's, uh, just shows you when you don't refresh these things uh, and you're 67, they don't pop up the way they used to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there have been a, a Nature Neuro paper the year before that found there were a couple of, of uh, loci that seemed to predict, uh, you know, uh, attentional drop off, let's say. Yeah. And so in order to, to kind of tie our hands, we use those as our regions of interest. Because as you know, in this business, you can do a lot of post hoc shopping. Yeah. Uh, and so in order to not do that, we, we constrained ourselves in that way. Okay. And this was an incredibly pilot, pilot, pilot study. But we got lucky. It was 20 per group, uh, 20 adults with ADHD, and, and 20 controls were recruited on Craigslist. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's great. And we got, you know, interesting differences in the default network and, and all of that. And again, the timing was right. Uh, we'd learned all these things we had to, to account for. Uh, and so it went into biological psychiatry with uh, next to minimal uh, work. But the, this was the actually the second paper from our group. The first one was the anterior cingulate one that Daniel had been working on with Mike. Uh, okay. Started it after Claire, but it, got, it came out before hers because he basically, uh, you know, sent it to NeurImage and, and the only thing that uh, uh, Randy Buckner told me, he was the reviewer who said, can you give us more data about what it looks like in an individual participant? And so we, you know, we, we added some supplementary figures of, of mapping the, the anterior cingulate to a single person. And this was around 2007 to 2009. Yeah, yeah, 2007, yeah, yeah 2007, 2008. And so uh, we got in, you know, just as this was sort of exploding. Yeah. Uh, and so Mike, uh, really sort of supervised 44 papers while he was a resident. That's, yeah, he was <laughs> prolific. That was unbelievable. I mean, his work is, uh, yeah, and that's, he's <laughs> a machine. That's, I mean, he's just, he's sort of for another planet, right? He, he, he has a visual memory that I've never encountered before. He, he will never forget, uh, you know, Yep. screen that he's seen and and he would say remember we saw this on such and such and th <laughs> <laughs> i'm the word guy you know yeah. i'll, I'll yeah. put it into words so that was sort of our thing is that he he was uh sort of sniffing the stuff out and, and i'm pretty good with words and so we were able to, to make some cases and we were able to get some grants and and kind of uh and then the other person who really gets credit for this two people um Don and Rochelle Klein. So uh, Don Klein, who, who unfortunately uh, died about two years ago now, um, is was an amazing uh, individual. Rochelle Klein is, is where still is. In fact, we're we're going to visit her tonight. Uh, and Don, uh, in 1963, discovered uh, panic disorder and its treatment with imipramine. Uh, he was one of the early psychopharmacologists, and as part of that, back in the 60s, they were giving imipramine to everybody at Hillside Hospital uh, to see what it would do. And uh, the nurses noticed that this guy who would come in several times a day complaining that he was dying had stopped doing that in the last week after starting imipramine. Oh. And uh, the guy didn't think he was any better, but uh, when that Asked him, you're not coming to the nursing station anymore. He said, well, they never helped me, but why this week? He said, well, you got to learn sometime. Um, and so he realized that this was a syndrome yeah. and that, uh, that, you know, this was, uh, and, and so he spent the rest of his career really working out the pathophysiology of panic disorder and understanding that it's a derangement of an alarm system that all of us have because we originally came from, you know, ancestors that often lived in caves. And if you're starting to run out of oxygen, before you realize that, you start to have a buildup of carbon dioxide. Yeah. And that makes you want to get, you know, out of there. Well, that's interesting. Uh, and so it's, it's a uh, dysfunction of, the, uh, of an alarm system that produces this, you know, I've got to leave uh, sort of desperate sense. Yeah. Yeah. And he's traced it to the carotid body and to uh, 
the fact that the carotid body is innervated by opiates, and that, that's why opiates produce overdoses, is that we lose people who are on opiates lose the ability to sense air hunger. Interesting. Okay, and so they they don't wake up because in order to take a breath because it's it, that system is completely shut down by the opiate. Interesting. Okay. Okay. If they're sleeping, it's uh, yeah. And uh, so at any rate, Don Don was this amazing uh, clear thinker, and he was uh, sort of uh, knocking around and and you know. Uh, giving his advice and he would per periodically prod us with, if you guys think this stuff is, you know, is useful, how reliable is it? Uh, you know, cause he's seen a lot of things that just really didn't, yeah, it's that standard. And so he pushed us to, to start looking at test free test reliability. Um, and again, it was, it was bootlegged and, you know, wasn't funded by anybody, but we had gotten some grants. And so we called those people back yeah. Uh, to, to get rescanned a year later, you know, and it, it wasn't terrible, right? It's not like it's, it's, it's an ICC of 0.8, but we got ICCs in the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 range. And so yeah. it, was, it was not nothing. Right, right, that's something. And then we did that with all the different measures, you know, so we did it with seed-based and we did it with ALFF and we did it with group, uh, you know, uh, uh, network-based uh, approaches and, and all of that groups, uh, uh, and uh, so that, it, it was an amazing experience of, of being sort of exploding and beginning to go to HBM, um, you know, San Francisco, uh, for example, I think it was 2009. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, seeing that there was a kind of viable line of work there. It was, it yeah. was not, uh, you know, it was, it was starting to get accepted. And then 2010 in Barcelona, Yep, you know, it was sort of exploding, right? And then people started complaining about where's the task-based imaging? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, well, let me just um, let me just sort of uh, sort of fast forward a little bit to um, you know, sort of the state of so 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 there was this development of of resting state, and then you developed you started accumulating databases, sort of similar along the lines of maybe not longitudinal, but databases. And, um, but then, so uh, just to, you know, maybe have a discussion right now about, about, you know, the field right now. And, and so where yeah. we're having, we're seeing things, we're seeing group differences, we might see some individual differences, but, you know, it's, it seems like it, it's all very, um, you know, not quite reproducible enough. And then maybe once we see something, what can we do? How can it actually impact clinical? Yeah. So I think we're really in a transition from, uh, you know, the exuberant optimism that we needed to, to sort of break through initially, uh, and convince ourselves there's something here. Uh, and then the increasing awareness of, uh, this is a long, you know, challenging slog. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, Enigma uh, is showing us in the structural space that uh, there are likely real differences uh, relating to, to psychiatric syndromes, but you need gigantic samples because yeah. the sample sizes are, I mean, the effect sizes are, you know, they're never more than two tenths of a standard deviation I and mean, it's small. So is that potentially? So I, I was wondering about that. So I'm so I, you know I have these ongoing discussions with people in a, looking at the ABCD database, and and their thought is that maybe, uh, you know, it, it might be worthwhile to turn around instead of having you know your group sort of allow the data to sort itself out, and then to see maybe you know the, the whole idea of you know our doc or, or or trying to sort of maybe let the data tell you how the group. The subjects in some sense and maybe i think that's true but it, but it's also we still have a fair amount of methodological work to understand all of our confounds so yeah. joshua vogelstein works closely you know with everybody including with mike I and mean, he was in mike's uh, lab meeting last week and uh, talking about uh and you should probably talk with joshua uh about his variation on combat trying to address the demographic uh, the way in which demographic confounds can really mess you up in terms of site differences. Yeah. Uh, and how, uh, I mean, there's so many factors that, that we kind of try to forget about, all of which are costing us effect size. Yeah. Uh, and so I think as we become more conscious of those, 
For example, the, the upshot of what Joshua was telling us is that we need to, he didn't take it this, but I, I took it to the fact that uh, I hope, and if, when I see Nora, I'll tell her this, Nora Volkov, uh, that ABCD needs to uh, plan on including a group of ABCD sort of uh, 18 year olds as phantoms. Huh. Okay. Because at the end of the day, there is no other way to really work out site differences other than to scan the same people on multiple scanners. Yeah. Okay. And as these, in the, as these kids, you know, age into young adulthood, uh, getting a certain number of them to, to take some trips and maybe it can be done, you know, not everybody has to be on every scanner, but this can be done with, with some nice uh, method methodologists. Yes. So that uh, there would be a real Rosetta Stone of brain by machine uh, interactions that could then be used to sort of back, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah. not perfect because it would have been nice to get that done at the beginning. Right. Uh, but but uh, but really, uh, all the other methods Joshua showed us are, are you know, they're approximations of that. Uh, and uh, it, it's going to take all the things we can think of to extract as much of the relative variance so that we can start to try and make sense of brain behavior relationships. Yeah. They're there and Enigma shows, you know, they exist, yeah. but they're so small. Yeah. And most of our designs are not set up to identify them. One yeah. of the questions you asked, you know, is, is there room for small science? And I've, I've been pondering that because that's what I do now. You know, Mike does, and, and many people are doing big science, but these are, that's a whole different, ball game, right? And the simple answer is, it's tough, but you know, you can still, if you do it, you've got to do it within subject, you know, treatment uh, or, or longitudinal or something where you can leverage the within subject aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, because that helps. Uh, and then it's proof of principle and, and, and trying to, you know, is there a hypothesis that then needs to be examined in other ways? Or deeply scanning one person or some small yes sample yeah 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 regard so you know the, the standard uh, 17 per group uh, you know comparison uh, cross-sectional uh, it's seen its day right it was important to get us to the point where we could learn about what some of the problems are yeah um, but it's not held up as really being sufficiently reproducible so so it, given that, let's say you do have these tiny effect sizes and they only really show up after, you know, huge amounts of, of data. Do you think that there's hope? For, I mean, you know, the next step is to try to actually develop these, you know, so-called biomarkers or something, you know, either multivariate analysis or, or whatever to be able to then put a person in the scanner and say, oh, well, you should require this treatment or you have this version of ADHD or something. So I, I, I keep telling, saying that I think that's a, uh, a fool's errand. Uh, we will never, it, it would be silly to spend a thousand dollars to get a diagnosis of ADHD. Yeah. Uh, and it's also a whole lot easier with ADHD at least to try a treatment uh, and say, okay, that didn't work for you because we can find out in a few days. Right. Uh, but, but there are a lot of people with ADHD with whom we don't have as much success as we should. We don't really understand. Uh, and what's always been missing in psychiatry is the understanding of, of physiology and pathophysiology, that most of medicine either is fairly well along or, you know, it's really very far along. And so COVID has been a disaster. But, you know, how many days after the, the SARS-CoV-2 genome was uh, put on the web, did people start making vaccines? Like three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have that physiology down, right? Yeah. Here's, here's a genetic sequence. This is what it predicts. Let's start making RNA vaccines against this. Wow, right? Yeah. When you understand, you can fly. Yeah. And we are not even treading through mud. I mean, we're just still digging away, pitching away, you know, yeah. with, with our bare hands at this massive uh, wall to try and break through. So you think so it's, it's really trying to get to understanding physiology. So we're gonna have to do this in conjunction with basic neuroscientists. It's gonna have to be with really trying to get an understanding of 
you know, and this is what Mike and, and uh, Charlie Schroeder and others literally today we're talking about is how do we take our ability to work with the non-human primate, with patients within, you know, epilepsy who are having electrodes, with imaging at multiple uh, levels, with dreads, with opto optogenetics, in order to get to convergent hypotheses about circuitry and about the physiology. Uh, and so that's what I think is beginning to get tantalizing. Yeah. Uh, and I see that as sort of the next frontier and imaging will contribute to that, but it won't be able to get us to all of that on its own. It's going to be because it's accessible and because when we have very well-defined questions, then we can say, okay, here's where we think it's, it's gonna, uh, yeah. Terrible. See. The other piece is that imaging is improving. Uh, and as you very well know, all of us uh, to this day blur uh, and, and, you know, do things in, in MNI space or some other kind of standard space. We, we throw away so much uh, of the information yeah. in order to be able to get statistical inferences. Uh, and it's not something we can do on a ready basis yet, but, but uh, native space has got to be where we go. Yes. Uh, hyper alignment or other kinds of things or like what Jim Haxby has been right. working on so that we can try and, and you know, uh, use other kinds of ways of aligning data, uh, I think is, is gonna be an interesting way of trying to, again, eke out more, uh, more of an effect. Yeah, I think that will really improve a lot of the sensitivity is if you can actually do that uh, a little bit more since you have so much, you know, spatial variation even in structure, uh, and then the normal yeah. templates are not perfect. And then in the, in the you know, movies, as, as we uh, yeah. talked about earlier, the idea of having people watch movies so that you can drive their brain in, in yep. sort of massive ways and make it much, much less painful, right? It's really boring to sit and look at a <laughs> plus yeah. sign on the screen. Right, of course, you kid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any length of time at all. Uh, but to the extent that you can sort of keep things flickering in front of them and use the same stimuli across a whole bunch of people, that becomes a pretty viable way. And uh, Mike, is, Mike Millen is showing, you know, that works pretty well to, to give you uh, intrinsic functional connectivity. Um, and uh, it, what matters more is how much bold data you're able to acquire. Once you get over 20 or 30 minutes, you start to get to a not exactly a sweet spot, but a better spot in terms of test re test reliability yes. and, and more of a trait based way uh, of developing indices. Yeah, and he's thinking of doing like multi echo as well, and and uh, you know that might help exactly give you a little bit. And yeah, yeah. And so there are ways of leveraging. So things. all of these are small fixes, right? But that's the way evolution occurs. It's a little bit here, a little bit there, and pretty soon you've got wings, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're able to fly or whatever. Yeah. And so it's that sort of, uh, you know, tinkering with it that, that I think is, is gonna move forward. Yeah. So I think it's still gonna be fun. Yeah. yeah. But it is, it's a big challenge, obviously. Yeah. And do you think that, do you think that, um, you know, neuroimaging, right, can, can give you sort of a, a sense of the, the, neuro, the neural correlates of, of you know, let's say ADHD, for instance, and you'll know, you know, what areas are, are not functioning as, as normal, but then, you know, to neuromodulation or medication or, or what, what can you do then? So the problem is that with any, any entity, ADHD, we, we, once we name it, we think it's an it, right? None of these are it's yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so it, when you know it, you, you break it up into the dozens or hundreds of, of relevant subtypes. And so that's the challenge is you have to start with that because otherwise you don't make any progress. But as soon as we're able to begin to fractionate and that's where, again, this was Don Klein's uh, you know, suggestion. When, when you don't know what to do, intervene, do something. And then the effect of that, you can measure that and if you do that systematically, then all of a sudden you have a little bit of control as opposed to it's purely correlative because you're just at the mercy of, of chance yeah. in that regard. And so uh, I think that it's more, again, going from uh, layering imaging studies on interventions uh, and then trying to back, back into, okay, those who responded versus those who didn't respond, can we learn anything about them? And then can we use that to predict uh, and understand the potential mechanism through which they may vary? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there's so many factors, again, time of day, uh, yep. you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Uh, but as we begin to look at 
alertness, arousal, uh, how those are interacting. And, and uh, you know, it's not, it, we, we, we have a large challenge in front of us, but it's not an inconceivable one. Yeah, and, it, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's not like we should have our goal day-to-day -day clinical application, but more sort of understanding, you know, the mechanism so we can actually make smarter choices about what to do. That's the real payoff. That physiology produces uncountable benefits. Right. And I learned this in my training because I would flip from psychiatry to, to pediatrics. And one day I was uh, halfway to the hospital without my calculator and I had to run home because a pediatric intern without a calculator is a killing machine. <laughs> I never needed a calculator as a psychiatry training. You know, yeah. is a 20 milligram dose back then. We only had right. one dose, you right. know? And so profoundly non-quantitative versus everything was on a milligrams per kilogram or, or per body surface area, you know, measures or, or whatever. Yes. And uh, in pediatrics, it's not like everything is figured out, but if a child has a fever, what's the age? If they're less than two weeks, it's an emergency. You hit them with antibiotics before you do the spinal tap. If they're seven years of age, ah, Tylenol, and we'll figure it out in the morning, you know? <laughs> and, or, you know, is it uh, rheumatologic? Is it uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Right. And so we, you have a hypothesis, and then you have ways of testing and working through that. And then there's always a few cases that leave you scratching your head, but the vast majority of this proceeds in a much more early way. And in psychiatry, it's trial and error because we, we just have these very amorphous uh, categories that are better than not, but th that's why we have our doc to try and get to another layer. Yep. But again, our doc is an important approach, but I, I still think it needs to be a bit more Done with a bit more humility. Yep. Uh, you know, it, it sort of has become a little bit too real. Uh, and uh, it was always, you know, if you read it, it's supposed to be a provisional framework, right? Uh, but it's too easy for it to become really, you know, this is this is our doc, therefore it's, it's good. Or, yeah. 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 You know, but it's really about trying to, the goal has to be understand physiology. Yes. Yeah. You know, what's our, and, and in fact, a lot of the things that affect us in other physiologic systems, inflammation is becoming, you know, front and center in many, in many psychiatric syndromes, right? Whether it be depression, autism, schizophrenia, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, what I see as positive is that we're developing this more, uh, humble, uh, large-scale approach where we, we put up data and we say, okay, everybody can look at it and uh, let's let's see what we can all learn yeah. uh, together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we will we will have some fun surprises in this process. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the, yeah. The neuroscience is driving this with the amazing advance. You know, what's going to come after dreads and optogenetics? I don't know, but I'm sure there's people that things you know, that are cooking. I mean, even uh, other treatments, I mean, who knows? But um, uh, yeah, my brother, my brother's actually a psychiatrist and, and it's always, I get a firsthand sense. I mean, it's, he's very intuitive and he's sort of like, you know, it's, you know, good psychiatrists have sort of a feel for these things. And it still feels like there's, you know, it's somewhere between science and, and folk science in some sense. And yes, it's a real, it's too much of an art form. And it's, you know, the, there are museums filled with art, right? That is amazing, but you can't reproduce that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You want it. You want to have something that works every single day. You know, if you can set it up to make it an engineering problem, then you can mass produce that, and then you can figure out how to make it. You know, whatever. Right. So that's the challenge: is to go from the artistry of a few to something that can really educate us about how the brain organizes itself and why it doesn't use its amazing abilities to reorganize itself and its plasticity to take us out of the ruts that we sometimes get into. Yeah. I mean, that's the, you know, it's such a plastic organ. Yeah. And yet uh, it can be so challenging to, to break out of that. So there are mechanisms that are producing some kind of, of stuckness in a sense. That, that's interesting. That, way of you know, again, Don, Don would say, you have to look at, at, you know, there's a big difference between uh, bipolar mania 
and the psychosis of that and schizophrenia. Uh, treat the, the manic patient who could be as crazy as anybody or crazier, and then they're completely healthy and you know no problem at all. So that tells you that it's not that the whole system is broken in a profound right. way, but there's some kind of regulatory system that just stopped working. So you think there's actually, and that's actually was sort of related to another question of, you know, with psychiatry, it always feels like it's more mitigation of, of the, the effect as opposed to actually, you know, fixing them completely. Um, is, do you think that there's hope for, you know, actual, you know, resetting in some sense? Uh, uh, well, it will never be easy because of course, you know, the brain is pretty damn complicated, yeah. but uh, unfortunately it's gonna be a kind of patchwork, I think, uh, very much like cancer where, you know, if you, if you happen to have chronic myelogenous leukemia, which used to be a death sentence, uh, but now, you know, Gleevec was the first molecular medicine that turned out to turn that into a simple, once a, one pill a day, you live and die, you know, of old age, basically. That's another story of how that almost did not come to be, but we won't go there. Uh, but, you know, that's true for one particular kind of leukemia, but then you can have another, you know, a, a, a acute lymphocytic leukemia and there is not such a treatment. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, there will be, uh, you know, some uh, individual, uh, situations, I think, where, where one particular thing sort of makes a difference and it turns out that it's possible to either turn that back on or to, to put in, uh, you know, uh, some sort of stem cell or something that, that really uh, can help to nudge the, the plasticity of the system. Because, I mean, the brain is ridiculous. It, it keeps on learning and keeps on, you know, adapting as long as possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there's some pieces of this that just become too difficult to overcome. Yep. And so is that, you know, is psychosis so intractable, intractable because recurring, you know, episodes of that have really produced so much uh, damage that then you get the cognitive deficits, then you get, you know, the inability to sort of return from that vicious circle in that regard, it gets in the ruts. And that's yeah. an interesting way of looking at it, sort of thinking of the brain as sort of figuring out a way to sort of get out of these ruts in some sense. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and then the question is how early can you can you find those? You know, what's the evidence of that? So that's where, again, a lot of the, the work in terms of using imaging to try and get uh, the forerunners, whether it's in dementia with, with amyloid or tau, yeah. uh, you know, where I think that's where the first payoffs are gonna be is that because there's 15, 20 years right, of advance notice that someone is sort of walking along that path. Yes. And how can we help to, to reverse that? Uh, I mean, I think one of the major uh, insights of this last decade was the discovery of lymphatics. Uh, 2013, the awareness that we power wash our brain every night during deep sleep. Yeah. That's, Talk about uh, a jaw dropping insight. Yeah. It'd be nice to image that robustly with MRI. I mean, we're so I bad. think, Peter, that's got to be done. <laughs> yeah. That's got to be done. Yes. And you can do that in the intramural program because you it. can have somebody going into deep sleep, right? And yeah. see, there, there are physio physical changes that are occurring yes. in terms of cell shrinking and water, you know, uh, fractions dramatically increasing. Yeah. And uh, document that and, and getting a sense of that, that's, I mean, again, uh, my, my wife is a sleep physician and, you know, it's not like our children are perfect by any means, but we take sleep so seriously because uh, we become so aware that that is one of the things you can really do. Yes. Uh, yes. That, that can have long-term sort of payoffs and, and uh, both in development and in decreasing the deterioration that, that all of us are sort of prone to. Yeah, L Laura Lewis actually at MGH has some nice promising work in terms of looking at that sort of pulsation that modulated by sort of suggestive of lymphatic systems. But um, but yeah, it's hard it's, it's hard because it looks, you know, the the, the time scales and the, and the, the, I mean, it looks like a lot of other things. So, so it's hard to, 
nail that in that, that regards. So, but we're working at it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's where knowing that it's got to be there because of the work in, in animals yeah. gives us, that's what's necessary, right? Yes. There's a real specific physiologic hypothesis. Yes. And so then it becomes a technical challenge of how are we going to design the studies so that we capture this process that we, we know has to be there. Now, it's not so easy to sleep in a scanner and all that. So you probably should do what the sleep people do, which is to get people to come repeated nights so that they get used to it. Yes. Yes. Uh, because the first night's always terrible. But, uh, you know, after a while, you sleep anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, or if you're sleep deprived or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I yeah. think, um, yeah, that, that's certainly something where, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, uh, and yeah, uh, I think it'll just be a matter of time before we get a good, robust measure um, in that regard. I mean, there's, yeah, no, we've already, oh, wow, we've, we've been going on. Um, <laughs> this is great, though. This is awesome. I, I mean, there's so much to talk about as far as, you know, the, uh, I mean, all of your other studies, but um, maybe we should shift gears a little bit. Uh, and just talk about, um, you know, you're the OHBM. Last year, you won the Mentor Award. And uh, I have to say that was my most gratifying moment. Uh, it, it was virtual, of course, but, but I, I, I've been fortunate to get a few awards here and there. And part of that is if you're old enough and, and you don't disgrace yourself, you sort of, you know, <laughs> eventually you get in line. But this one, especially getting the first one, really meant something to me, especially because I had to do nothing for it. It was just a surprise. <laughs> That's the best type, right? People sort of conspired, and all of a sudden, I got this notification. Well, aside from um, the adventure, uh, um, I mean, you, I mean, what? Well, you know, I, I now have children, but before that, I poured it all into into my students and colleagues. And as I said, uh, Judy Rappaport, I, I'll never pay off the debt that I owed to her, and Don Klein and Rochelle Klein, uh, and and Bob Porter before that in psycholinguistics, and and people like that. Uh, you know, stretched and, and extended so much of themselves to me along the way that I've always felt that, uh, I mean, they didn't need me to pay them back, but this has always been my sense of, of uh, how I, I, you know, live with myself because I've been so fortunate. Uh, I started out in Bolivia, you know, and wound up, you know, I'm a tenured professor at NYU. Uh, it's, it's not too shabby. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this life is just so enjoyable, you know, and working with, with Mike Millen and Daniel Margulies and Claire Kelly and, and uh, you know, uh, Chao Gan Yan and, and Xinyan Zuo and, and the list is just too long, right? And, and Lucina, uh, Uden and, and, and others. Yes. Uh, the fact that four of them have been young investigators. Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm just blown away. You, you know. must be doing something, you know, fundamentally right, either to attract them or to nurture them in the right direction. Well, I, what I've thought and tell them is I, I promise I won't get in their way. Yep. Uh, and I try to understand what people want and what they need. Uh, it doesn't always work, but I, I, I do my best to, to literally, uh, you know, get out of their way and, and, uh, help them to, to get where they need to go or where they want to go. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's been different for each, each one of them, uh, but it's so gratifying. Um, and so that is, that is the joy of this. Uh, and, you know, I'm still plugging away with my own work, but I'm not going nearly at, uh, with the vigor that I did when we had this huge lab that Mike was really essentially running. Um, I, I enjoy working with him even now. That's part of what's so fun is that we get to interact on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, and almost uniformly, I've, I've decided that the brain is our model. And so the fact that neurons develop and maintain their connections uh, with other neurons that they left as they you know, go on their path forward uh, is the model that I like. And so I tell people that anyone who's come through the lab is still part of the lab. Yep. And so we have, you know, a synaptic web that now extends around the world. That's a great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're constantly growing. And, and, and so uh, my, my sense is mentorship is for life. You know, I tell people as far as I'm concerned, uh, as long as I'm around, I'll give you feedback and I'll respond to your questions and I'll write your letters and, and all of that. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's just joyful. Yeah. 
That's, um, I think that's another aspect of it, right? Sort of sensing your own, you know, sense of joy uh, with this as well. I think that makes a difference between, you know, whether you're optimistic about a project and you do it and you're successful versus not. I mean, a lot of it's sort of these subtle things uh, as far as the director is concerned, but yeah, no, it's certainly, you've been successful at, at that and uh, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it does seem like, right, the mentorship is, you know, it's, it seems like it's many layers, like you were saying, it's sort of, you know, setting the atmosphere, giving the encouragement and giving very specific advice, but also, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of being an example of the, the spirit of, of what they should be, you know, the direction of how they should go. But yeah, and, and I've, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a whole, it's hard to define. Um, but as I said, everybody needs something a little bit different at different periods. Yep. And uh, so understanding that what they want and what they need is not always the same. Uh, and that can sometimes be a little bit uh, challenging, uh, but usually that works out okay in the end. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's also about culture. I was very grateful to be uh, formed in the intramural program where the culture is essentially so cooperative. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, we would just right. so gratefully give away data sets to, to students who would come through for a yeah. month or two and, you know, take a first authorship, please. You know, no one's got the time to write this up. <laughs> and in so many other institutions, in some, in some institutions at least, there's a real sense of this is mine. Yep. And, you know, I, I'd rather wait for a couple of years till I get to it uh, to, instead of letting someone else take it from me. And then we never get to those. Right. You know, there's never enough time. Yeah. Uh, and so much is left undone because of that sense of hoarding. Yeah. Uh, and so that was what was fun about going to NYU to a brand new, uh, you know, place was that there was no... Uh, culture to fight against. I had the ability to sort of uh, transplant that cooperative generosity that I inherited from the intramural program from Judy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, keep that going. And that's what led us, you know, to this idea of giving away data. Uh, and it came from a talk that Corey Bartman gave at the clinical center in which she talked about C. elegans and how everybody in the C. elegans community shared everything. Because they all came out of one lab. Yeah. And the same yeah. thing with, with uh, fruit flies. And so those are like hive minds, you know, because, and, and so that's how they got to the, the worm connectome before anybody else, because they all just really worked as a, as a unit. And when I told Mike about that, I said, we got to do the same thing. And uh, he then ran with it, you know, and so he made the, the thousand functional connectomes and, and, we basically used peer pressure, right? To, to get people to share their data. And we said, we'll do all the work and here, we'll send you a hard drive, just send us the, yeah. the data and we'll, we'll put it together. And I really do think that those early databases were completely instrumental in sort of helping to, you know, open up the culture as far as that's concerned. And yeah. We'll realize it's not a zero sum game. It's, it's definitely everyone benefits from this, so. Um. So anyways, uh, I know that we need to stop, but yep. well, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, this has been great. This has been wonderful. It's been really, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a, a walk through memory lane. And, and actually, I've, I've learned a lot, actually, just hearing your, your perspective of, of the history from, from, you know, as what you've been doing has been, has been awesome. And, uh, and yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for being on. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. Yeah. And, right. and again, it's, it's a wonderful community. That's what's so, it's just, you know, I can't yeah. wait till we're able to meet again in person. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, and see yeah. you guys virtually. Uh, in, yeah, in, but uh, you know, we're still being somewhat uh, cohesive and we're still keeping in touch for the most part and sometimes even more so uh, through Zoom and everything, it's becoming easier. So, but yeah, no, I agree with you. The, 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 the imaging community is, is really, it feels like a family and um, it's continuing to go in that direction. So, and it's not you. like the brain is a common enemy, but it's such a challenge that I think it just forces us to band together because there's no way any one of us is going to make sense of this without all of us doing it. I completely uh, agree. You know? Yeah.
definitely. But well, a lot of work to do and, and, and thank you very much. Neurosalience is brought to you by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This week's episode was produced by Anastasia Brovkin and Ekaterina Dobrikova.